Now our next speaker is Dr. Kate McCarthy, uh, who is an infectious disease specialist at uh, Royal Brisbane and Women's Hospital um, and at St Andrews War Memorial Hospital. Uh, she's also a clinical microbiologist at Pathology Queensland and she's the clinical lead for the OPAT service at Royal Brisbane. Um, she's part of the uh, Queensland Hospital in the Home, oh, just lost your bits there, Hospital in the Home uh, statewide guideline committee. Um, and has quite a bit of research interest in this area. Uh, the other thing about Kate is I'm pleased to introduce her because uh, we spent quite a lot of the early 2010s uh, sitting in desks next to each other trying to finish our PhDs. So over to you, Kate. Thank you, Ben, and thank you for bringing up such a memorable time in my existence. <laughs> Um, so look, what I was asked to talk about uh, tonight was um, a more practical approach to OPAT and I felt this was better framed as uh, OPAT challenges. And so what I'm going to cover in the next 20 minutes is I'm going to look at OPAT in the context of Oviva, which um, Ed has already introduced us to. Um, the tension between AMS principles and considerations in antibiotic choice and how we deliver OPAT. Uh, long-acting agents um, in bone and joint infection and the evolution of the OVAT model, of the OPAT model I should say, and that's really I think excitingly being pushed by COVID but has been happening prior to that as well. So I'm just going to page down. So OPAT in its simplest form um, is the administration of a parental antimicrobial agent that avoids an overnight stay in hospital. So within that model, uh, there are benefits and disadvantages, all of which are very well published. So the advantages for which many of you are familiar include patient satisfaction, including increased autonomy, um, avoidance of hospital related morbidity and mortality, uh, possibly a reduced daily cost in care, but that really depends on the model being used. But the disadvantages can be that without careful patient selection, you could potentially do more harm and certainly there's some evidence around uh, endocarditis there. Um, again, if the program's not well governed, you can have an increased length of stay and an overall increased cost of a patient's admission. And then antimicrobial stewardship could also potentially be um, compromised with collateral damage and, and, you know, if there's some maybe effect on the microbiome. So the OVIVA trial uh, certainly had a significant uh, impact on OPAT and um, certainly prosthetic joint infections are a big, have been a big driver in the literature and, and the development of many services. And so the OVIVA trial will be well known to many members of this audience. Uh, for those who are less familiar, you know, it's a UK wild multi-centred trial, randomised controlled trial. And we really had one year outcomes between very early switch to oral antibiotics versus the standard of care, which was intravenous therapy. And they had to receive it for at least six weeks. Now, it was a pragmatic trial um, as it took all patients with bone and joint infection, um, irrespective of the surgical intervention um, or the antibiotic choice. And as you can see, and Ed has alluded to, um, if the columns there on the left, um, the last column is the total numbers We've got um, patients with depridement and implant, reten implant retention with 23% of the cohort. Uh, those in which they had prosthetic joint implant removed, another 12.8% of the cohort, and then the one stage revision, which made up another 8.5% of the cohort. So prosthetic joint infection was reasonably well um, represented. Now, in terms of the uh, outcome of the study, we had treatment success in 86% of patients at one year. Um, irrespective of the route of antibiotic administration. Um, now, when they looked at secondary outcomes, including length of stay and treatment costs and vascular device rate of complications, they were all lower uh, in the uh, oral um, arm of the trial, but that's perhaps no surprise. There are limitations, however, which have been well pointed out in the literature of this study in that bone and joint infection is not a homogenous entity. Uh, the study was not powered to differentiate between major infection groups. Um, appropriate timing of the IV to oral switch remains uncertain. Gram-negative infections and gram-positive infections resistant to multiple classes of antibiotics were uh, less well represented in the study. And the study really depended on very well set up um, expert uh, teams with specialist lead management. 
So ideally, I would have further randomised controlled trials for the subgroups of Oviva and certainly studies um, in the local context. So how has this affected OPAT? Well, traditionally, as Ed has alluded to, prolonged intravenous therapy was preferred over oral therapy. Uh, but now these patients, we're seeing them on OPAT, but we're seeing them for much shorter courses of intravenous antibiotic therapy. But who remains? So the patients that remain for longer courses on the program are those that have concomitant bloodstream infection or other sites of infection. Uh, those that have bacterial etiologies with uh, limited oral options due to resistance and also those patients that um, have been intolerant of the oral regimen or uh, have had drug interactions. And again, if we look back at Oviva, one in 10 of the patients randomised to oral therapy either switched or remained, um, remained, switched to or remained on IV therapy. So perhaps representing those first two groups I've listed. And then one in four patients in each treatment arm experienced a serious adverse event, um, which required them to change to IV therapy. So it's obviously intolerance um, of their regimen. The second thing, I guess, uh, in terms of um, OPAT and how we use it with prosthetic joint infection is uh, a very important um, topic, which is antimicrobial stewardship. So this is defined as safeguarding antibiotics in order to preserve their current use and preserve their future utility. So as a uh, member of an OPAT team, what we're trying to do is select the optimal antibiotic drug. So this relates to choosing the antibiotic spectrum, the dosing of the drug, the duration of therapy that you give, the route of administration, um, we attempt to minimise unintended consequences such as adverse drug reactions and as such minimise the cost related to these adverse effects and also particularly in OPAT uh, stability uh, of these drugs in the community setting is very important. And there's often a tension with all these AMS uh, principles with how OPAT is set up. So OPAT is defined as convenient patient-centred treatment and optimal service delivery is often uh, based on single daily visits. So I'd like to talk, uh, really sort of touch upon from here, um, a few of these AMS principles and what we've been doing in our service in terms of strategies to optimise AMS when we feel that the selection uh, in terms of AMS is perhaps not optimal. So the first of which relates to stability, which is going to be touched upon later on, so we'll only be going into a minor way. And so the stability of a solution of the antibiotic is dependent on a number of factors, including the temperature of the solution, the achieved antibiotic concentration in the infuser, for example, uh, the concentration of the solvent, interestingly enough, the type of the container holding the solution, whether it's glass or plastic, and also whether a buffer um, is utilised. Now, I live in Brisbane, which is a, a subtropical setting, and as such, our uh, patients go out in reasonably hot temperatures, and many of them do not actually have air conditioning. Now, what we did to look at this in terms of our antibiotics is that we've, um, over the 13 weeks of summer from 2018, we had Melly Willing, um, actually it was the pharmacy department that really helped me run this study, a uh, pharmacist who carried a bum bag with a 250 ml bag of normal saline with a temperature probe uh, within that bag. And they carried it during their waking hours over the Brisbane summer. And as you know, uh, temperature affects not only the rate of infusion of your elastomeric device, but also can affect potentially the stability of your drug. And what we found was that um, for 47, almost 50% of waking hours, people's um, uh, fluid bag sat between 25 and 30 degrees Celsius. And then for another 30% of that time, it sat between 30 and 35 degrees Celsius. So actually this was much hotter than I expected. And on the right, you can see there were sort of peaks of really high temperatures, including up to 55 degrees, which probably related to the interval getting into a hot space such as a car. So in terms of how this impacted our service, uh, we give lots of education around uh, keeping the antibiotic infuser cool and perhaps it doesn't have so much effect on us st more stable antibiotics, although perhaps we don't have the data we'd really like there, but it certainly affected how we were administering our less stable antibiotics. And so as a result, we started looking at therapeutic drug monitoring in this setting. 
So we don't use meripenem that commonly on our service. Uh, you have to really need it. And in these four cases, which we actually, Amy Legg, um, who was our pharmacist at the time, um, wrote up, we use therapeutic drug monitoring to enable these patients to go home uh, with good education around keeping the antibiotic cool and also to give us a night where we could sleep and make sure that we were happy that they were actually receiving the drug that we thought they were. So what we have there is four patients who required meropenem uh, and had it by an infuser on the OPAT service and were able to achieve good levels as measured by therapeutic drug monitoring. Um, what we measure is the unbound drug um, by liquid chromatography and we also measure the MIC of the isolate to then have a look in comparison to the drug level. Um, Ed has raised the issues about we don't really know the levels often at the site of infection. What we're measuring is um, blood levels. Um, and also there's the issue of what really does your drug level uh, need to be to be successful. Although writing up the paper was satisfying, the reality is the work on the ground to actually get these patients out on the program was a lot of work. What this meant for us was that these patients were having BD um, antibiotic infusions, which put significant pressure on our service where the nurses delivered the drugs. And so we had to often move them to self, the self-connecting service. We had a lot of education around the community-based nursing staff about how they took drug levels and how you actually got the tube back to the lab on ice. And then the other issue is around the shelf life of a manufactured um, antibiotic. And by the time it actually gets to our site and to the patient, how long we've got before um, it expires. And so these patients are generally uh, very, um, uh, take up a lot of time of the service. We did the same again uh, with ampicillin and one of our registrars wrote these patients up. And again, uh, they took considerable work to have on the program and we had to have really close attention to manufacture and also utilisation of the drug within the allocated um, time frame. The other drug uh, we've been thinking about more recently is vancomycin and um, target level attainment to optimise therapy. And we audited the number of people that went on to our OPAT program who'd actually reached therapeutic drug levels before entering the program and it was only 11%. So we have a patient who is not uh, therapeutic provided going onto the program. They then changed on to a infusion that takes 24 hours to reach a further steady state. Um, the, there is a lot of education with our registrars about um, it being a random vancomycin level that's not equivalent to a trough level uh, when they're on the service. And then there was a previous ETG recommendation about reducing the dose when changing onto an infusion, which is um, no longer recommended in all circumstances. So what we've been looking at here is using um, Bayesian modelling. So basically where we have a population, um, population pharmacokinetic properties and we combine this with the most recent PK information from the patient and whether we could, uh, we're currently looking at whether we could get them to a faster um, state, steady state uh, than we are currently. We know the literature shows that in general, a um, greater number of patients achieve their target drug level with fewer blood tests. Uh, and this sort of process maximizes drug toxicity, uh, sorry, minimizes toxicity and also maximizes efficiency. But clearly when they get to the OPAT service, we're much further uh, down uh, the diagram than starting at the top when the patient's first seen in hospital. Um, the limitations of this are, however, um, you're as good as the data that's entered and, you know, it requires financial investment so the, the software um, costs money. Um, OPAT is certainly a uh, individualised service uh, in the sense that we monitor all the patients in terms of drug choice and then also we monitor all the patients quite closely for adverse drug reactions. And the OPAD outcomes registry um, indicates that about three to 10% of antimicrobial courses are stopped while on OPAT um, due to an adverse um, drug reaction, reaction. So again, um, close monitoring is um, you know, exceptionally important on OPAT with um, appropriate blood tests um, for the relevant patient. So those few factors I've just described are nicely um, represented in the um, paper on the screen. And then we have really barriers that exist within OPAT. Um, and also facilitators for um, adequate um, AMS principles. So 
Um, and I guess the one of the things that we commonly encounter is the, the transmural nature of care in which, although I'm based at a central hub, often the delivery of the OPAC care is through nursing staff that are at a um, more remote hub. And so we often, uh, or we may, um, have deviations from recommended treatment regimens, regimens and, and follow up, which is, um, requires um, governance. I just wanted to briefly touch upon, uh, you know, two longer acting agents in the OPAT space. Maybe this, you have this less of this tension between what OPAT is and um, good AMS principles. And the first is um, ticoplanin. So as you're all aware, this is a highly protein bound glycopeptide antibiotic and really extended dosing of ticoplanin was the first described in 1997. And then there's been subsequent publications um, as listed down the bottom regarding dosing guidelines where you administer this drug two or three times a week. And this then suddenly allows for ambulatory care for patients who are for whatever reason unable to have daily antibiotic um, therapy. Certainly the dosing uh, to do it three times a week is much higher, so 15 to 25 milligrams per kilogram. And what that has seen is um, a higher rate of adverse drug reactions, which as you know, consist of um, hypersensitivity reactions or um, uh, neutropenia or, or thrombocytopenia, etc. Um, the other drug uh, which uh, I guess fits into that longer acting category is Dalbavancin. And um, this is again a um, relative of um, ticoplanin. Uh, it has a high bone concentration, a good safety profile and a long half-life. And um, there's emerging data on it, you know, not much data to be honest, but emerging data on it being used in bone and joint infections. Uh, it's infused over 30 minutes and is given weekly, though there certainly was a paper about administering it fortnightly. The dosing in the literature in the retrospective studies that have been published is quite, um, you know, is a little bit variable ranging sort of 1000 to 1500 milligrams um, per dose. And I recently tried to get it for a patient who I thought it would have been ideal um, and encountered the high acquisition costs of $1,600 for a 500 milligram vial. Um, and if you were giving three times that with 1,500 milligram dose, and it was going to take us two weeks to get it from overseas. And by then really, uh, I think the boat has sailed in terms of the uh, potential patient engagement. Uh, the cost savings for this drug um, are, uh, you know, are postulated to be seen through shorter or avoided hospital uh, hospitalization and, and um, adequate uh, treatment of infection. Obviously, uh, for Dalbavancin, uh, the monitoring is around um, the risk of myopathy and rhabdomyolysis, which can occur in 2 to 14% um, of patients. The last thing I wanted to touch upon, which we've all been thinking about a lot recently, perhaps more in the healthcare than in the OPAT setting, is um, models of care. So. In the literature, there's really three models of care for OPAT, an ambulatory um, centre of care, self-administration at home, and also administration at home by the nurses. And before we even, uh, you know, you even get to your OPAT service, a lot of that's already been, uh, you know, set up through political and social and financial drivers, which are all in place before you even uh, enter the service. And so this, I guess, in, in practical terms, will affect your geography of your service, the funding you have available, the expectations the patients have of your care and also um, the staff roles. And um, I know in uh, the UK, and I'll be interested for Mark's um, comments on this, I think they have more uh, nurse practitioners and certainly expanded um, pharmacy um, roles than, than we do in the Australian setting. So in terms of the models of care, I wanted to uh, just um, focus on three things. Uh, the first of which is the self-administration of antibiotics. And so this is a question we often get to our service. We have a large self-administration cohort, and I think there is literature to support its safety. Um, the uh, first paper there is, is certainly the largest cohort over many years, and it didn't show any um, excess complications, readmissions or line infections. The second paper, interestingly enough, did find um, increased um, external leakage and extravasation and occlusion and um, uh, irritation at the side of the line uh, in their self-administered service. But they did this very nice multivariate analysis that when they were actually able to look at the line 
uh, as well as the service and many other factors, the etiology of that was the fact they use so many midlines as opposed to pick lines, which are more common um, in our setting. And the last paper is a, um, a paper from the Australian setting, which supports, again, the self-administration of antibiotics. So um, telehealth uh, is certainly something we've all become more familiar with recently. Uh, we've had a telehealth program in our uh, health service for uh, many years now and our patients, often it's um, published in the uh, remote setting as being a, you know, a tool that's utilised. Um, we use it within uh, our catchment, which um, is, you know, some of these patients aren't actually uh, that remote, and we use it as a way of supporting staff. So when the staff is um, with the patient, all our staff carry iPads and they dial in, and so we just have an immediate um, teleconference at that time. The second way we use it, and I think um, uh, the uh, cartoon on the right, you know, it's very important um, that we know that telehealth can't replace a clinical review. But I do believe that it can supplement care, um, certainly in the OPAT setting. And so um, we have a, a clear think about what we want to get out of um, our routine review of the patient. And if clinical examination is not part of that required for that day, uh, then we may do it by telehealth as opposed to um, uh, bringing the patient into the hospital setting. And to be honest, there has been some pushback recently about patients coming into the hospital um, setting, which we've had to, um, to work with. The last thing I just want to mention uh, is the mobilised trial, which um, I won't say too much about, but this is a trial, a pilot trial that we've recently conducted our centre uh, that is about uh, being submitted for publication. And this was really bringing the OPAT model, so the model of a someone with a um, infuser and a um, uh, sorry, an antibody confusion that they wear around their waist uh, into, the, into the hospital model of care as opposed to the standard model of care with a pole and a pump. And what we looked at here is we looked at nursing satisfaction and pacing satisfaction. And we actually looked at um, uh, mobility by an accelerometer um, on, the patient's, um, on the patient's leg. And um, so this is, I guess, using the OPAT model uh, in a slightly um, new way. So hopefully today I've walked you through um, highly bioavailable antibiotics and the impact on OPAT, um, the tension that exists between antimicrobial stewardship um, and often how OPAT services are set up, and also the changing model of care of OPAT, all of which play out in our everyday practice. Thank you. <laughs>